this is what I would like to uh, show you. In here, this is the uh, photograph of the debris that was seen in General Ramey's office at Carswell Air Force Base in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. This is my father holding up uh, what is very obviously parts of a uh, radar target with uh, balloon debris. In here, you see both wood fragments. You have actually parts of the balloon envelope in of itself, and uh, you have what looks like paperback metal foil. And to emphasize this, this is not what was seen on the floor of our kitchen that evening or that late uh, early morning hours in 1947. This is totally different. The implication is that Major Marcel may have been ordered to take part in a cover-up that involved switching the material from Roswell for a common weather balloon. General Ramey and the Air Force now discounted their earlier press announcements that they had found a flying saucer. The story was officially dead. But back in Roswell, those who had reported the original story found that the military were behaving somewhat strangely over what they now claimed was merely a weather balloon. Frank Joyce had been the first to announce the original news of the flying saucer at local radio station KGFL just a few hours earlier. I got a phone call. Well, I got a number of phone calls, but the one that really got my attention was purportedly from the Pentagon. There was a young lady on the line saying, Colonel so-and-so, uh, this is the Pentagon calling. And this was within a few minutes of it going out on the wire. And the voice on the line says, uh, who is this? I tell him. He said, you put that story on, on the air about the flying saucers? And I mean, his voice was, you know, the type that really conveys menace and power. And I said, yes, I did. And he says, you're going to get in a lot of trouble uh, for this or made some, some threatening comment. And I said, look, I'm a civilian. You can't talk to me this way. You can't treat me this way. You can't tell me what to do in stories I put on the air. <clears throat> and he says, I'll show you what I can do. And bang, hung up the phone. And the voice at the other end of the line showed exactly the power that he had to the owner of the radio station. I got a call from Washington from one of the offices of one of the senators saying, look, if you put out any stories on this, this thing, you're going to lose your license. And it's not going to be over a period of time. It's going to be the same day that we tell you that you're off the air. Frankie Rowe, the fireman's daughter who had handled some material, had always regarded the Air Force in Roswell as friends of the town. But an unexpected visit from the military to her home would now cast the Air Force in a sinister new light. He had this club or stick or whatever it was and he would, was beating it on his hand and he would hit it. Every time he would say something he'd hit his hand. And he said, I want you to know you were never there. And I didn't understand what he meant. So I said, yes, I was. And he said, no, you weren't. I said, yes, I was. And he said, can't you get this through your head? You never saw anything. You were not there. You don't know anything. And he said, you know, this is a big desert out here. We can just take you out in the middle of this desert, and no one will ever find your bodies. He said, you'll be nothing but bones, and nobody will ever know what happened to you. And I told him I would not talk about it. If it were not for the threat, the entire Roswell affair could be viewed as nothing more than an embarrassing mistake. But in 1965, Butch Blanchard, now a four-star general, attended a reunion dinner in Roswell, and the incident had not been forgotten. Uh, he had been the commander here in 1947, and uh, I was at a table with uh, the general and several other locals when they were interrogating him about the 1947 incident. And uh, he declined to, to answer uh, any of the questions, except he did comment that it was the damnedest thing he'd ever seen. He never would discuss it, but several, several months later, one night, uh, I badgered him again, as I like to do, and he said, well, and then he paused. He said, I'll tell you this, and I'm paraphrasing him because I don't remember exactly how he said it, but in essence, he said, uh, what I saw, I've never seen before.
For 30 years, the Roswell incident remained a dark secret. Town and military maintained an uneasy silence. The story didn't see the light of day until 1978, when Jesse Marcel, the 509's intelligence officer, went public with an appearance on American television. I was amazed at what I saw. The amount of debris was scattered over such an area. It took me a while to realize that there was something strange about it. But uh, the more I saw the fragments, the more I realized that uh, it wasn't anything that I was acquainted with. I proved I tried to burn it, it wouldn't burn. I, I, I tried to break it, it would not break. If it was something of ours, uh, that would, I'm sure there would be no reason to keep it under cover that long. It's an aerial spacecraft. There's another reason why it would not ever be known by anybody here un until they found out more about it. I sense that it was, there was a cover-up someplace about this whole matter. In 1947, General Ramey's chief of staff was Colonel Thomas DeBeau. Shortly before he died, he was interviewed on home video. As a retired brigadier general, he is the highest ranking officer ever to comment on the Roswell incident. It was a cover story, the balloon part of it. It is the story that's to be given to the press and that is it and, and anything else, forget it. And McMullen, if you ever knew him, he, if you told him that he wanted to run something, he goddamn sure ran it. He, he knew every facet of the operation, he's a busybody. He, he wanted to. He wanted to know what the hell was going on, who was pissing on the sidewalk, and all that sort of thing. General McMullen, the deputy head of Strategic Air Command at the Pentagon, was in charge of the entire operation, according to General DeBose. McMullen told me, you are not to discuss this, and this is a point of which this is more than top secret, as he said. It, beyond that, it's within the, my priority as deputy to, to George Kenney, and he in turn responsible to the president, this is the highest priority you can exist, and you will say nothing. And that's the end of it. And Jesus, that's in the commander in chief, and, and, you just, and you forgot about it. The revelations of DuBose suggest that the American Air Force did indeed have something important to hide. There's no question about that. General DuBose said that specifically to us that the uh, the balloon explanation that the Air Force offered was a cover story to get the reporters off General Rainey's back. So we have a white body of testimony that was a cover-up. We have military witnesses saying they were sworn to secrecy. We have radio employees telling us that they uh, were told if they broadcast their interview with Mac Brazel, they better look for a new job because they'd be out of the radio business the next day. We can show that beyond a shadow of a doubt. There's no question there was a cover-up. 